Hey everybody, welcome back to another how-to episode. My name is Kevin Thatcher, the title king here at Independence Title, the premier title company here in South Florida. And we're gonna do another document overlay talking about how to read your title commitment. This is a very, very important document that I remember years ago when I used to work with a couple of uh, private lenders. There was very few that would actually ask to see the title commitment. And the title commitment is a very important document. Most buyers, most investors, most realtors do not understand the value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little play-by-play -play of how the title commitment works. We're going to review it line by line. I'm going to tell you what you're looking at. So you yourself, when you get a title commitment from the title company, you know what you're looking at. It's very, very, very important in the closing process to be able to make sure you know what you're looking at because the title companies a lot of times will throw things on there that maybe you want to have removed and they won't be removed unless you actually challenge them. So let's think of it this way. You go buy a car and you're going to order car insurance and you get this temporary uh, insurance binder. You get a binder that says here's your insurance binder because you're not going to get your policy for maybe a month or two. Uh, down the road. It's the same when you're talking about title insurance. You will not get your title insurance policy typically could be three to six months after closing. Now we issue it within the first 30 days because we use e-recording which we've talked about on previous episodes but some title companies are three to six months behind. How do we know? Because with these investors that are flipping property there's a lot of times we're waiting for that policy or they want to get the reissue credit discount and I say I can't without the policy so we have to call and fight to get them to do the policy. So now as an overlay you're going to see here the title commitment. This is the first page of the title commitment and as we start reviewing it I'm going to explain to you this is just a sample. I'm going to explain to you some of the things that you'll see in the different sections and what you need to take at least a glance over to make sure things are right. So as you're looking at this document you see here this one was issued from Westcore. Westcore is one of our national underwriters. Us as a title company we are an agent for a national underwriter. So here at Independence Title, we use Westcore and we use Old Republic, two very well-known, very well-funded and highly rated title insurance underwriters. So you're going to see here, it's going to talk about the state and the county the, the property is located in. And this is what's called Schedule A. Page one is Schedule A of the title commitment. Schedule A is important because you're going to see Billy Buyer. This is where you're going to see and make sure that the buyer is correct. If the buyer is married and their spouse wants to be on title, it needs to be listed here because a lot of times we'll have the closing as Billy Buyer without uh, the spouse. So it could be a married man or it could be, uh, you know, Beatrice Buyer as a married woman without the spouse listed. So if you want your spouse or the client wants a spouse listed on title, you need to make sure they're on the purchase and sale agreement. You need to make sure if they're getting a loan, the lender's aware that they are married because there's times when we get the closing and we only have one person and all of a sudden they say, well, they're married and it wasn't on the purchase and sale agreement. So we may have not known about it. And then to the right of the buyer's name, you're going to see the amount of insurance. And in this sample, you're going to see $500,000. That is typically the purchase price of the property. So you have to make sure the buyer's name is right. Make sure it's spelled correctly. Make sure if the buyer has any middle initials, you're including them on the purchase contract because that would flow through onto the title commitment. And why is it so important? Because if you get a name that is very common, there could be some problems when they go to sell it because there could be some judgments or some tax liens, things that are done in that similar name. So by using a middle initial, it helps us eliminate the liability for the buyer, at which point they may turn around and sell the property. So it's always best to use the full name, maybe the full name as it appears on the driver's license. So realtors, get a copy of the driver's license when you're writing the contract to make sure you have the correct client and the correct spelling listed on there. Now you go down a little bit and you're gonna see Larry Lender. That's the name of the lender that's gonna provide financing. In this case, it's a financing transaction, so it's not a cash transaction. If it was just a cash transaction, you would only see the purchase price. You wouldn't see Larry Lender listed there with a loan amount, in this case, of $400,000, which is 80% loan. So in this case, again, you need to make sure that if there's a loan, we're listing the lender on there and that there's a loan amount. Again, it's very important because title commitments get sent out sometimes and there's no lender listed, but meanwhile, the buyer is getting a loan. So again, it's very, very important. Then you go down to number three, which is talking about the estate or interest in the land. 
So generally you're gonna see fee simple, which means that the owner of the property is gonna be buying the property, the land. Sometimes you're gonna see their listed uh, leasehold property. A leasehold property is typically a co-op where they own shares in the co-op itself, in the organization. They don't actually own the fee simple interest to the property itself. So you wanna look and just make sure fee simple is typically what you're gonna see. You're gonna leave that usually up to the title company. And then very important, number four is gonna be Sally Seller. This is gonna be the seller who holds title to the property. A lot of times we get purchase contracts, which we've talked about in previous episodes, which says uh, owner of record. And it's always, I always get a little chuckle about it when I do my presentations and I say, well, who is owner of record? If you are the seller, if you're the realtor representing a seller, you need to know who has the legal right in order to sell the property. In Palm Beach County, where the seller gets to choose title company, a lot of times we'll do what's called curative title work. And for some of the REO firms that we represent, we do curative title work as well, where we're gonna pull all of this information prior to even getting a purchase and sale agreement. The seller is gonna hire us at the beginning to pull a title search, pull a lien search, to see what underlying issues there are that may need to be cleared. So in that case, you'll, you can just ask the title company who is the actual seller of the property. It may be an estate. Sometimes we see people signing, they think they have the, they're the heir to the estate, but meanwhile probate was never done. So it's very important to review this part of the title commitment to say, oh, the seller on my contract matches the seller on the title commitment and it's listed properly again with the spelling of the name. And then we're gonna go down to number five, which is one of the most important is the legal description. The legal description of the property is not what you see on the property appraiser site. Those are short legals. And a lot of people, when they do these quick claim deeds, they prepare these deeds and they use the short legal that's on the property appraiser site. And that is not the legal description of the property. What you need to do to find out the legal description of the property from a title insurance perspective is you need to go to the last good deed of record, not a quick claim deed. We're looking for the last insurable transfer of property, usually via a warranty deed or a special warranty deed. Uh, in, in that case, that's the root of title that you wanna go to and verify the legal description there. And I tell people, don't go on, off of a certificate of title because we've seen more and more times now that the banks are foreclosing and they're using the wrong legal description. We've called for several re-foreclosures to have to modify the legal description on the property. So it's very important. You wanna go back to the root of title, which is the last deed that you can find that either says warranty deed or special warranty deed. It may be when the per person that got foreclosed on, it may be that deed when they purchased it. And if you look at that deed, that's where you're going to get the legal description of the property. You can do further investigation and make sure the title commitment's right, because as the buyer, you wanna make sure you're getting the right property. So yes, you're relying on the title company to do the job. But imagine if you as the buyer compared your legal description to the one of the last deed and you caught a discrepancy, you're saving yourself from a title claim down the road. So it's very, very important because mistakes do happen. And another spot where you can get it is if you're getting an appraisal on the property. If you're a buyer and you're getting a loan, typically you're gonna get an, a, uh, not an appraisal, a survey of the land. And on the survey of the land, that's when the surveyor goes out and they actually measure the legal description of the property and they lay it out. Sometimes it's simple. In this case, you're gonna see on page two, it's a very long legal description. Sometimes it's very simple. It says lot block and the subdivision name and the OR book and page. In this case, you see how lengthy this one is. This one talks about um, lots, blocks, inches, feet. So it's a measured out distance, which is a lot more difficult for everybody. We have to go through degree by degree and line by line to make sure it's right because one little degree off and it could throw you into the neighbor's property. So again, in this case, I gave you the example of a longer one. Sometimes you'll see one that are slightly shorter where it just says lot and block and it's a very cut and dry subdivision. So you wanna make sure your legal description is right. So that's part schedule A. Now we're gonna go over to schedule B, section one. There's two sections to schedule B, schedule uh, section one of schedule B and section two. And they're both unique and they're both different. So here on Schedule B1, these are what are called requirements. You see here at the top it says Schedule B number one, requirements. Requirements are everything the title company needs to complete in order to issue clear 
and marketable title to you as the buyer. So some things you're gonna see on here, you see number A is the warranty deed from Sally seller to Billy buyer. So that's saying that we need to get a deed from the seller to the buyer, which again is very common. Then you're gonna see a mortgage here. So if the buyer is getting a loan, you're gonna see a mortgage from Billy buyer to Larry lender. Again, very common, very uh, simple to see here uh, where you're gonna make sure that they're getting a loan. And then you're gonna see a little footnote there that talks about spouses. So if there's an individual that's buying a house and it's their primary residence, meaning they're gonna live in the house, their spouse must sign. And there's a slight discrepancy that a lot of people don't get is we always say the spouse has to sign the mortgage. That's actually not the money. In real estate, the mortgage is simply the security instrument that gets recorded in public records to secure the promissory note, the promise to repay the loan, which may only be signed by let's say the husband or the wife, but the other spouse must sign this document in order to make sure we have the legal right to secure that note. So they're agreeing that the note is secured against the property. They may not be financially responsible. So the mortgage doesn't mean that that person that's signing the mortgage is financially responsible for the loan. They just, it just means that they're gonna be the rightful owner of the property. Very, very simple. And then a lot of times you're gonna see here, payment in full of mortgages, that's the seller if they had a payoff, if the seller has any federal tax liens, uh, if there's a homeowners association, it's gonna call for an estoppel certificate. Uh, we're gonna order a lien search from the city, which we talked about in the previous episode, how to read a lien search, talking about code enforcement, permits, utilities, things of that nature. You're gonna see affidavits here that may be a continuous marriage affidavit to eliminate some type of judgment that's out there in the name. Uh, so these are all of the items that you're gonna to have to see signed at closing or recorded at closing and completed at closing in order to issue clear and marketable title to that buyer. Now, when we're talking about a marked up title commitment, which it's funny, when we call other title companies and ask for it, if we're doing a double closing, they typically say, well, we can't mark up the title commitment. And it's not because they can, it's because they don't understand what a marked up title commitment is. Your marked up title commitment is your insurance binder. So if that title company, for whatever reason, fails or doesn't close or doesn't record or doesn't issue the policy, you now have this marked up title commitment, which is your temporary insurance binder. So by marking it up means they're slashing across all of the requirements saying all of schedule B number one, the requirements to issue clear and marketable title have been complied with. It's just a simple line that says deleted, meaning they're deleted from the title commitment because they've already been completed. And if your title company says they can't issue a marked up title commitment, you need to find a new title company or hire a real estate attorney to press them. Because I guarantee 100% there's no title company in the state of Florida that is not allowed to issue a marked up title commitment. It's what you're paying for as the buyer. You're paying for title insurance, you need your temporary insurance binder. And I have a client that came back months later for a title company that failed to pay off a second mortgage and that second mortgage holder was coming to foreclose on the property. And I said, well, who was the underwriter? And the investor had no clue. They only knew who the title company was that did the closing. So this is more so, it's very important because you would know if, I, if the title company went out of business, you'd be able to go in this case to Westcore and say, Westcore, your agent issued this marked up title commitment, you need to stand by your product. Got it? All right, now we're gonna move on to another important part, which is Schedule B number two. Section two of Schedule B are standard exceptions. Exceptions mean you have no coverage. So you're always going to see the standard exceptions. And what mistake a lot of title companies make is the standard exceptions are typically not removed from the final policy. They usually flow them through without removing them. And there are a few of them. If you got a survey of the property, you need to make sure the standard survey exception is removed. And if you did not get a survey, for whatever reason as a buyer, you decided not to get a survey of the property, the standard exception would stay on there. And then there's a lot of other items that you'll see. So it's basically items number one through five here. Number one is talking about uh, just defects and liens that are out there. Uh, so you wanna make sure you're reviewing this to say, please send me a marked up title commitment, removing the standard exceptions. And they'll either do one of two things, remove all of the standard exceptions or 
only remove a select few depending on the type of, of transaction that's closing, as I said, if you got a survey or if you didn't get a survey. The second part, which is even more important, are the other exceptions. You're probably not going to understand some of the exceptions that are on the title commitment, but some of the important things you want to look for are claims of lien, maybe violations that you didn't know about, because what happens is a lot of people will just put things on there to hide them. So this way, if it were to come back as a problem later, they'll just say, well, you knew you got the title commitment and you knew these items weren't covered because it was listed there. And let's be real. Did you as the buyer know what you were looking at? Probably not. So you wanna look through, a lot of times you'll see some easements, things with the city. Uh, you may see uh, declarations of condominium or homeowners associations, things on here. In this case, you can see agreements. You could look them up. You can ask for copies of them and see what they are. This one, you see a lot of them. And I used one that had a large number of uh, exceptions so you can kind of see what these standard exceptions are and and what other exceptions we have listed that kind of look common none of these are going to be uh, removed from the final policy they are going to continue on these are things that have happened with the land over the course of time that are not covered in title insurance and if you go to the last page you will see a few that do get removed and what happens is at closing a lot of the title insurance companies will leave these items on the title commitment, which means, guess what? If it's on the policy, you do not have coverage for it. So you need to look at this and say, yes, we're removing all the standard exceptions one through five because I received a survey. And then here you're gonna see number 30 and number 31. Number 30 talks about assessments. If you live in a homeowners association, which this property did, the title company ordered what's called an estoppel certificate to make sure that all assessments for the property are, are current, current and paid. So they need to remove this. If they've ordered the estoppel, they need to give you coverage for it. And then most important is number 31, which is the lien search. I've seen title companies nowadays are having the buyer sign a document saying, we've ordered a lien search as a courtesy to you. A courtesy, I don't know what that means. You either ordered a lien search or you didn't order a lien search. And if you ordered a lien search and I paid for a lien search, you better hope you're giving me coverage for the lien search. So you'd wanna make sure number 31, that's the one that most of the attorneys will always call and say, make sure you remove it. And us, when I do the final policy, I look at it and if there's a lien search, I remove the lien search coverage. If there's a title search, I, I mean an estoppel, I remove the assessment uh, exception that's listed on the policy. So again, I hope you learned a little bit by how to review a title commitment. The last part of it again is that marked up title commitment. You wanna make sure as the buyer or the buyer's lender or the buyer's realtor, you are asking for a marked up title commitment at the closing table. My staff, each one is required before a file goes into funding, they mark up the title commitment saying how each item was taken care of, whether it's an estoppel, a lien search, a, an affidavit, a deed, a mortgage, whatever they're removing, they're crossing it off and they're writing why. Why was this removed? Or maybe it was removed because underwriting said remove it. If you leave the closing table without a marked up title commitment, you're making a big financial mistake because title companies can go out of business, the underwriters could potentially fail, and you have no recourse to go back to them to say you agreed to insure this. You're gonna have a lot more leverage if you have that marked up title commitment. So as always, I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of Title Tuesdays. Please subscribe below. We're trying to come up with many, many topics. You can give us comments below on what topics you'd like to see. Give our office a call. But if you do not hit the red subscribe button below, you will not get notified of the next episode. So thanks as always for watching. We look forward to seeing you at the closing table.